Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today for Save Some Green. We've got a lot to talk about today, a lot of great information, but before we really get rolling, there's one thing that I need to address, and that is that everything you hear today uh, shouldn't be taken as official legal tax or accounting advice. Uh, if you're inspired to action by what you hear today, I'm absolutely thrilled to hear that, and I strongly recommend that you pursue independent legal tax accounting and any other kind of professional advice to suit your individual conservation scenario. So with that out of the way, let's talk about conservation and taxes. You know, the name of this presentation is Save Some Green. It's an intentional play on words because there is a, a little known but a very, very uh, beneficial interplay between the conservation of ecologically sensitive land through organizations like the Thousand Islands Watershed Land Trust and the tax implications of making such a gift. So we're going to go through our conservation toolbox today. We're going to talk about some of those tax implications and we're going to basically give you all of the information that you need to make an informed decision decision about con uh, conserving a piece of private property. The first thing, of course, that you need to understand when we talk about this is what exactly TWILT is. You know, TWILT stands for Thousand Islands Watershed Land Trust, and we are a non-governmental, non-profit charitable organization. Our mission is to permanently protect land in the Thousand Islands watershed region through acquisition or conservation agreements and to achieve good land management through stewardship agreements and education. And really what this means is that we take a two-pronged approach to conservation. The first is this sort of boots-on-the-ground conservation where we work with willing landowners to turn private property into permanently protected, um, protected spaces, uh, ecological land, and then we steward that land forever, uh, protecting the uh, conservation values for which it was originally donated. The other angle that we take, uh, which we're not going to talk too much about today, uh, but today is an example of, is our education program, where we work with people of all ages to foster a love for nature in general and the incredible area that we are fortunate enough to live in. We've been working on these uh, missions since 1993. We've made a great lot of progress, and I am so excited to be sharing all of this information with you here today. The first question uh, that we need to talk about is why here? There are an incredible number of reasons that conservation is important right here in the Thousand Islands watershed region. And we have people interested in conserving land here for all kinds of reasons. Maybe it's because 25% of all the species at risk that live in Ontario can be found right here in the Thousand Islands watershed area. Maybe it's because we have a one-of-a-kind extension of the Canadian Shield called the Frontenac Arch, a granite arm that stretches across the, uh, the St. Lawrence River, creating the Thousand Islands and the topography that you see in this area that is unique in southern Ontario. Maybe it's because we have five converging forest regions here, meaning that species on the edge of their ranges can be found here living next to each other that wouldn't be found next to each other anywhere else in the world. Maybe it's because we live on one of the most important, if not the most important, migration corridors north to south in all of eastern North America. So important, in fact, that it has been recognized internationally as a UNESCO biosphere reserve. Maybe it's because six million plus people live within a four-hour drive of this area. We're talking Toronto, we're talking Ottawa, we're talking Montreal, and all of the places in between. This area is a destination. This is a place that people love to come and visit. They have cottages here, maybe a, a, another way to, to visit family that live out here, or something like that. And it is a place that so many people come to, to enjoy the nature that we have here. And we welcome those people. We love to share the incredible ecological value that we have here. But we also recognize that with this increased attention from people comes increased demand for development, for uh, more homes and roads. And we uh, understand that in the face of this demand, we also have to make sure that the ecological areas that this place is so famous for are protected so that all people now and in the future can enjoy the ecological value that is held here. Maybe it's because when you consider all of the land trust properties, all of the um, uh, other properties conserved by ecological 
organizations. If you consider both the national and the provincial park, the conservation reserves and everything in between, only 5% of our area is legally protected in some way. Now, there has been some really, really good scientific work done by some folks from this area, actually, in part, that tells us that the minimum that nature needs to thrive alongside humanity is 30% conservation. You may have heard of this principle, Canada 30 by 30, this program that Canada, along with dozens, uh, almost 200, I believe, other countries have signed on to, committing to protecting 30% of their land and water by the year 2030. Now, on a national scale, we're, we're not doing too badly, actually. We're just uh, south of, of um, 20% here in 2024. But if you scale that down locally to our area, we only have 5% currently under conservation. So there is a lot of work yet to be done. But in light of the work that's yet to be done, let's talk about the work that has been done. Twilt was incorporated in 1993. We're currently in our 31st year. And in that time, we've had our hands on 38 conservation projects in our area, totaling about 6,500 acres of permanent, high-quality conservation achieved. Of those 38 projects, 23 of those properties are currently under Twilt's stewardship, equaling just over 2,000 acres. And what that means is that some of these projects that we've worked on are stewarded by us. They're held in our land holdings. Some of these projects are held by other organizations. And this is something that we did especially uh, early on uh, in, the, in the early days of Twilt when we were still building capacity. You see, we understand that sometimes uh, bigger organizations with more resources are better equipped to take care of a property once it's been conserved. Again, especially true in the early days. And so what we're able to do is move very quickly and broker deals between um, the landowners that are selling or donating the property and these larger organizations that need to move a little bit slower before they can accept one. And through deals like that, we've actually managed to double the size of Thousand Islands National Park. We've added a third to the size of Charleston Lake Provincial Park. And we've done similar projects with the folks over at uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada and Ontario Nature as well. Over the past few years, Twilt has really been building our own capacity. We have a, a staff force now, and, uh, and we now have the capacity to manage and steward our properties in a way that we couldn't before. And so this number, this 23 properties under stewardship, is going up every year. Twilt is taking on uh, more properties, and we have the capability now to steward those properties ourselves. We're still thrilled to work with our partner organizations, the Parks, uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Ontario Nature, uh, and we still do collaborate on projects, but I'm very, very proud to say that Twilt is now, um, has, has been actually for, for a while now standing on its own two feet and conserving property uh, ourselves. Again, just over 2,000 acres currently in our holdings. So let's get down to the meat and potatoes of why we're here, the conservation process. Now we break the conservation process down into three broad steps. We start with notification and discovery, we move to ecological assessment, and then we go to appraisal and transfer. Now, this is a process that is set out by Twilt. The, we describe this, um, the way we describe this process is, you know, done by Twilt. But this is also mirroring a very important program that a lot of our work goes through. And that's the Ecological Gifts Program. The Ecological Gifts Program is a federal government uh, program that essentially allows uh, private landowners to donate a piece of property to a qualified uh, organization like a land trust and receive a tax credit that is reflective of the magnitude of that gift, of the generosity that it takes to make such a gift. I'm going to steal this story wholesale from one of our board directors, Marnie, who tells it very, very well. Um, but back in the day, even when Twilt first started, you could donate a photograph of a gorgeous local landscape and have that valued as an art product, donate it to a conservation organization and get a tax credit for the value of that photograph as an art piece. But if you were to donate the property, the piece of land that that photograph was taken of, you wouldn't get anything for your donation. And so the Ecological Gifts Program has come in to essentially right that wrong, to make sure that the people that donate 
property to conservation are recognized for how big of a gift that is. And so we model our process off the Ecological Gifts Program, partially because we work through the Ecological Gifts Program for most of our projects, uh, and partially because it is a very thorough process to make sure all the checks and balances are in place as we go through. Uh, and so that's how we've modeled our process. And the first step in that process is notification and discovery. And this is essentially just a, a blanket term to say, this is when we find out about properties. The vast majority of people that can serve a property through Twilt initiate that relationship with us. We are approached um, more often than not with these projects. These are people that maybe have a piece of family property that they love and has been in their family for, for generations. They want to see it conserved. This could be uh, people that um, bought a piece of property with, with no buildings on it and, and um, you know are looking to relieve themselves of the tax burden from it. These could be people that are buying pieces of property specifically to donate to a land trust because they want to see that property conserved. For whatever reason people come to us they do come to us and they want to see properties that they own be conserved forever and this is the first step in making that happen and it always starts with what we call very creatively the first chat and that is a no pressure conversation we basically do what we're doing today we outline the conservation process we let people know what they can expect what we can deliver on and how twilt can provide this service of protecting a piece of property in their name and the biggest part of that con uh, conversation is this decision how do we want to conserve a property this is also what we call our conservation toolbox, the suite of options that are available to landowners when it comes to deciding how best to put a property into conservation with a land trust. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of all the options and the variants that go through those as well. The first and by far the most common is a fee simple donation or sometimes just called a donation. And this is where a landowner um, is not looking to sell a property. Uh, they are just looking to transfer the title from themselves to the land trust. Uh, in that way, the land trust becomes the new owner of the property and also takes on all of the responsibilities that come with that. We take on the liability, we take on the tax burden, we take on all the things that a prudent landowner would need to do, like, uh, for example, cur curbing trespassing and taking care of the property, remedying damage. We also do uh, ecological work on these properties. We do research, uh, for example, on uh, species at risk bats and birds. We control for invasive species. Uh, we monitor for damage very regularly. We're out on the land all the time. In fact, it's the best part of my job to get out to these properties and see how they're doing. Uh, and, and really what we do is we... we take the gift that has been given so generously to the land trust, we honor the generosity of that, land, of that landowner, and we ensure that the conservation values for which these properties are donated are upheld forever. As I said, the majority of landowners approach us with these projects uh, or are told about this as an option and jump on it right away. Now, there is a variant that we can do when it comes to the fee simple donation, and that's with a little extra thing called a life lease. You know, sometimes it's the case that somebody really wants to donate a piece of property, they really want to see it conserved, but, you know, they love to hike the trails on it. They like to cross-country ski. They like to, to go birding on the property, and they don't want to lose the ability to do that. Well, thankfully, the land trust has uh, this tool available to us, this life lease, whereby during the process of donating a property in a fee simple donation, we can enter into an agreement that allows a landowner to continue doing the things on the property that they have done for the period of time that they've owned it. Now, the, the asterisk that goes on that is that life leases only really apply to things that are uh, positive or beneficial to the conservation values or at the very least don't harm them. Um, so things like um, hiking and cross-country skiing are totally cool. Um, we do have actually one property uh, that has a building on it that, uh, that the, the donor lived in when they donated the property and continues to live in. Uh, and it is separate from the ecological piece of the property. And so that is another uh, version that a life lease can take. It's a very powerful tool. It's a very customizable tool, uh, and it is, uh, in a lot of ways, the, the, the last piece of the puzzle that uh, gets people really excited and, and comfortable with this idea of donating a piece of property. Sometimes it's the case that somebody wants to conserve their property, but they're not finished with their ownership 
of it. They want to maintain their interest in the property. And for those people, we can offer a conservation easement agreement. And really what this is when it boils down to it is a legal agreement between the land trust and the landowner that donates a set of rights on the property. It's usually rights of development and it's rights of use. And they are all things that um, would be uh, detrimental to the conservation values of the property. So what we do is we sit down with the landowner, we talk about the property, about the ecological value that it holds and about the reasons that they love it. And we work with that landowner to essentially write a set of rules for the property. Um, It's oftentimes as broad as uh, things like, um, you know, uh, a landowner would not be able to put a helipad on the property or turn it into an airstrip or prospect for oil on it and and goes all over, um, you know, the, the spectrum of what a landowner would want for their property, all with the intention of protecting the ecological value there. Once we've come to an agreement about what those rules should be and where on the property they should apply, then we write it into this conservation easement agreement. We both sign. We do a report to look at uh, and document the current state of the property at the time of donation. And then that document gets put on the title of the property. And what that means is that that set of rules, that, that will for the property essentially that the landowner has written with the land trust, will then follow the title of the property. And all subsequent owners will be held to those rules as well, with the land trust acting as the, uh, so to speak, the enforcer of those rules uh, to come and inspect the property, make sure that the ecological values that it's been conserved for are being upheld, and make sure that, again, the generosity of the donation that was made is honored. The last way that we can serve uh, property is our rarest type of project, and this is a property purchase. Um, This is something we keep in our back pocket for these exceptional properties that, you know, even in many cases, the landowner wants to conserve, but for one reason or another is not able to. Sometimes these are properties that are already on the market. Sometimes we get a bit of an early warning that a property is going to be hitting the market. And whatever the reason... When one of these properties comes across our desk, when we we see it as uh, an ecological gem, a marvelous property that needs protection and is at risk of not being protected, um, we mobilize (laughs) and we uh, we work on fundraising, we work on uh, grants, we work on really rallying the community around these properties, and we raise the money to purchase a property for conservation. Now, we've done in our history a total of three purchase projects. It is our rarest type of project, but it remains a a powerful tool that we have when it comes to these exceptional properties that need to be conserved quickly and that may suffer ecological damage if they are not. This also has a bit of a variant that uh, can be put on it. And what that is is something called a split receipt or better understood as a partial donation. And what you're allowed to do, essentially, is sell the property for a percentage of the appraised value to the land trust and receive recognition for the reduction in price in the form of a tax credit. In other words, if you have a property that is appraised at $100,000, you can sell it to the land trust for $80,000 and then receive a tax credit for the other $20,000 that is left over, the 20% value that you reduced the purchase price by. And that's another way that we can recognize a gift. And it's a way that some of these properties that uh, the landowner perhaps wants to donate, wants to um, reap some of the tax benefits, uh, but can't afford a full donation, this still allows people to make that charitable donation to access those tax benefits and still you know, get a little bit of money in their pocket for their property at the end of the day. That's the, the first step. <laughs> um, and that, that conversation you know, really usually ends up with people walking away quite excited. Um, There's a lot of options available to people. uh, And in many cases, people see these options and they're able to decide right on the spot. In some cases, they need to take a little bit more time to think. Once we've had that conversation, and once we've, we've sat down with the landowner, we've said, yes, conserving this property through the land trust is right for me, and I want to do it in one of these three ways, then the land trust gets started on ecological assessment. Ecological assessment um, essentially is our way to prove to two people that 
uh, property is worth conserving. This is one of the backstops that comes in through the Ecological Gifts program, and it's one, frankly, that I quite enjoy doing. As you can see, look at that smile. <laughs> Um, the first person that we have to prove to, uh, that a property is worth conserving to is ourselves. We're a charitable organization. Uh, and when it comes to funding these projects, you know, conservation isn't free and it can cost the land trust uh, up to, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of $20,000 to even accept the donation of a property. We fund those projects sometimes through grant money uh, and often through donor money, uh, the, the donations, uh, financial donations that are very generously made to the land trust by our supporters. And so we do this ecological assessment as a way to make sure that we are spending that grant money or that donor money wisely and that the, the things that we are choosing to spend that money on are the, the best and brightest when it comes to the ecological properties that can be conserved for the time and effort that we're spending to conserve them. The other person, uh, person uh, in broad terms, of course, that we have to prove this to is Environment Climate Change Canada itself when we're going through the Ecological Gifts Program. And that's because, I'm going to mention it again, I promise I'll get, I'll, I'll get to uh, the details of it, the tax credit that comes with the donation of an ecologically sensitive property is very good, um, to put it, to put it frankly. And it's, if you ask me, it's one of the best deals that you'll ever get from the federal government. And so they have a big interest in making sure, again, that the properties that are conserved through this program are the best and brightest when it comes to, uh, ecologically sensitive properties in the areas that they're being conserved. And so we go out, we tour the property, and we look at everything we possibly can. Every angle you can take on ecological sensitivity, the land trust is considering. We do everything from zooming way out on Google Earth and looking at how that property may fit into the broader connectivity uh, strategy of the, the county, the province, the country, and the continent. Uh, and we also, you know, go to the property, down to the level of flipping over this specific log to look for this specific type of salamander. And we do everything in between. As I said, every angle that you can slice ecological sensitivity, the land trust is looking for. Some of these examples are species at risk, zoning designations, uh, connectivity value, and geological features. The great thing about uh, life here <laughs> as a land trust uh, employee on the Frontenac Arch is that this is actually a rather easy thing for us to do here because the ecological value of this area is so incredibly high. Let me show you this to demonstrate it. These are the categories uh, and the criteria that we have to go through when it comes to proving ecological sensitivity. These are set out by Environment and Climate Change Canada. And so when we're out, we're on the property and we're looking for all the reasons it should be conserved, this is the list that we have in the back of our minds. There are 19 A criteria that are more landscape level general criteria and 11 B criteria that are more um, property focused. Um, some examples of the A criteria are things like uh, areas designated as provincially significant wetlands or areas uh, that are designated as an area of natural and scientific interest. Uh, there's even one A8, areas designated as a World Heritage Site for Biodiversity Conservation Purposes or a core area of a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. That's an easy one for us here on the Frontenac Arch. We get into the B criteria, we get into more property-specific things. Things like uh, significant wildlife or fish habitats, significant woodlands, areas that are being used for long-term scientific study or, or baseline benchmark monitoring, uh, and things like that. Other reasons on the property level that a property should be conserved for ecology. The beauty of this is that in order to uh, complete our ecological assessment, we only need to prove one of each, uh, one thing from each of these lists. Um, as I said, we already get, uh, in many cases, a core area of UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, uh, and so we're really looking for those B criteria. Now, of course, that's not to say that we stop once we have one of each. In fact, you know, I've done uh, of several of these reports uh, in my time with Twilt, and it's it's very common to get five, six, seven, eight of each criteria here on the front neck arch. It is very um, very easy to prove ecological sensitivity here because our ecology is so sensitive. And every time I get to go out and do this and fill out this list and you know crawl around in the muck looking for frogs and salamanders and bugs, 
I am reminded of the gorgeous area that we live in and just how ecologically productive it is. And so this is one of my favorite, favorite parts of the job. So we've sat down with the landowner. We've decided, yes, donation to the land trust is the right move for us. We've gone out onto the property. We've proven both to ourselves and to the Ecological Gifts Program, if we're going through it, that this is a property worth conserving. Now comes the time where I go back to my desk and start doing some paperwork. And this is where we do appraisal and transfer. And this is where we're going to start talking about the tax credit. The appraisal is the basis of the tax credit, but this isn't just your average everyday run-of-the-mill appraisal. This is actually done by a specially qualified appraiser who is uh, qualified to appraise ecological gifts specifically. And it is based on the property's highest and best use. So essentially, when the appraiser sits down to value this property, they look at it through a very specific lens. If you were to do everything you could to milk as much money out of a piece of property as you could, what would it be worth? That's the value that they give to the property. And that value is the basis for the tax credit that is given to the landowner at the end of the process. Uh, Often it involves an on-the-ground inspection. I've had many, many (laughs) brave appraisers uh, in loafers and suit pants uh, trudging through swamps and forests with me. It's always a a very good time, and uh, (laughs) I'm constantly impressed by the grit that some of these folks have uh, when they come out to do these appraisals with us. So, let's get to the part everyone's been waiting for. The tax credit. The tax credit looks a little bit different depending on which of the three uh, methods of donation you have decided to go with. For a fee simple donation, where you're just transferring the property from the land trust or from the landowner to the land trust, um, the tax credit that you get is equal to 100% of the appraised value. That number that the appraiser comes up with based on the property's highest and best use is what your tax credit is. In addition, After the transfer, um, of course, the landowner is no longer responsible for the taxes on the property, the liability, that all comes to the land trust and you're able to enjoy your tax credit. If we do a conservation easement, uh, this is the one where we uh, essentially donate a development and usage rights. It's that legal agreement that allows the landowner to retain ownership and the right to sell even after um, the property has been conserved. They actually do... Uh, sort of two appraisals of the property. They appraise it in that same way, the highest and best use first. And then we actually give the appraiser a copy of the easement document, a a copy of those rules that we've written with the landowner for how the property can be used. And they value the property with those rules in mind. And that generates two numbers. And the difference between those numbers, the value of the property pre-easement Uh, minus the value of the property post-easement is the the basis for the tax credit in that scenario. Or essentially, it's finding the value of the rights that have been donated and recognizing that with a tax credit. The final way, uh, in a purchase, a straight full purchase, uh, that is not eligible for a tax credit because it is, at that point, a transaction. uh, It doesn't go through the Ecological Gifts Program. However, If we do a partial donation where we get an appraisal of the property, the landowner reduces the purchase price by a percentage, Uh, the minimum reduction is is 20%, and you can go all the way down to zero if you like. Um, uh, Very simply, the amount of that reduction, the percentage of that reduction, is the basis of the tax credit. So again, if your property is appraised at $100,000, you sell it to us for $80,000, that $20,000 that you've reduced the purchase price by is the basis for the tax credit that you get on your property. Now, these are already pretty solid tax credits, but I think it's in what I call the extras that come with these that really uh, are the selling point and really get people excited for the, uh, the accounting and tax implications of making these gifts. The first one uh, is one that <laughs> I, I is very much in the news right now and one that people are very, uh, very interested in talking about right now, uh, and that's the capital gains tax. Gifts that are made through the Ecological Gifts Program have the inclusion rate of their capital gains reduced to zero when the title changes hands. 
In other words, if you acquired a property, you know, p potentially decades ago, and now you have a capital gain of, of hundreds of thousands of dollars, potentially, as the value of property has gone, gone up, if you donate that property through a conservation easement, through a fee simple donation, through a partial donation, you don't pay capital gains on that property. Now, the one caveat to that is that um, as with the, the tax credit in a partial donation, you would still pay capital gains on the portion that you sold, but you would not be taxed on the capital gains for the proportion of the gift that you, that you donated. Um, this does stack with the tax credit. So in addition to the tax credit that you get for donating the property, the capital gains are also forgiven. The second big extra is that the tax credit has a 10-year carry forward, which means that so long as you have credits to claim, you can claim those credits for up to 10 years. You know, when we're talking tax credits based on the value of a property, this could be potentially hundreds of thousands, in this area, potentially millions of dollars. And so having 10 years to spend that means that you could consistently reduce your taxes year after year, so long as you have credits to pull from. And the final extra that goes with this is that there is no limit on how many of these credits you can use to reduce your federal uh, tax. What that means is that with most charitable gifts, you can reduce your tax uh, down to 15%. The government still has a minimum tax of 15% of your, your income tax, regardless of how many um, uh, charitable gifts you've made and credits you can claim in that year. Ecological gifts don't subscribe to that rule. If you have enough credits to reduce your tax payable to zero, you can do that. And because of the 10-year carry forward, you can do that for as many years as you have tax credits to do that. So with these extras, you can really um, move around and, and mess with this tax credit to give yourself some real financial advantages, you know, up to 10 years down the road. And this is one of the places where, again, I really, really recommend people talk to your accountants if you're interested in this kind of a thing, because there are a lot of ways that you can get creative with these tax credits and with these extras that come with them to, to really position yourself well when it comes to the, the tax implications of these gifts. Now, there's one last thing that I really want to talk about here, because we've talked a lot about um, money. We've talked a lot about ecology, but legacies are one of the biggest driving forces behind the gifts that are made. In fact, for a lot of people, uh, I'd say around half of the donations that I have processed in my five years at Twilt, um, the tax credit and stuff is are the, the sprinkles on the on the Sunday. You know, they're the extras that, that people are really excited to get. This legacy idea is front of mind for a lot of people, and it's front of mind for us. You'll notice our logo uh, says forever in these big bold letters, and it, it's bigger than the name of the organization. And that's because that forever aspect, this idea of permanently protecting and honoring the legacy of a, an ecological gift that is made by a generous donor, that is the most enduring part of land trust work. Long after, you know, our board has moved on, long after I've moved on, however many years from now, uh, in whatever iteration of Twilt we get to, the properties that we're protecting today will still be protected. This idea of legacies is reflected in our naming policy for the properties that are donated to us. For all of the donated properties, um, we internally reference them with a property name. And those are all, all in all of the cases of donation named after the people who made that donation. So we have the Macintosh property, we have the Ross property, etc, etc. The, the names of these people who have made these donations live on in the way that we talk about them, in the way that we discuss the ecology on them, the way that we reference them as a permanent way to honor that gift. It's a lasting reminder of those people's love for nature and a reminder that when passionate people take action, we can accomplish great things. 
I want to thank you all so much for your attention today. I hope that you've been in, uh, potentially inspired to action. I hope that you have all kinds of questions, and I welcome those questions. I would love to talk to you about your property, about conservation options that might work for you. And if you're interested in getting in touch and chatting about those some, uh, some of those things, you can email us, info at twilt.ca. You can uh, send us mail, P.O. Box 135, Athens, Ontario, K0E, 1B0, or the best place to get information, get in touch with us, is through our website, twilt.ca, T-I-W-L-T dot C-A. Again, thank you all so much for joining us today. I look forward to speaking with you, and I do hope you enjoyed. Thank you.